You know, you probably hear this a lot, but the Sega Dreamcast was so far ahead of its time. I mean, really, there are so many things coming up now or being used in gaming now that Sega brought to the table with this system. And recently, there's been a lot of talk around the situation with controller stick drift, especially with Joy-Con drift, but even with like the DualSense controller, with the Xbox controller, it seems to be just an industry-wide issue right now, which is a problem because, well, I, I mean, you use the controller a lot. Well, Sega actually figured this out over 20 years ago. And today we're gonna talk about a little known fact with the Dreamcast controller that goes to show that this system's aged even better than something like a mid 2000s Hideo Kojima game. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. So first of all, I got this controller in pretty recently. I had to do some cleaning on it here, but it was cheap and I figured, hey, you can't have too many Dreamcast controllers. But as I've been seeing more and more talk around companies trying to solve stick drift, it did make me think a bit, a bit about my Dreamcast controllers because if you've ever picked one of these up, despite them being like two decades old now, the stick still feels pretty good. Now you may have like these, these uh, the pattern on top that's for grip kind of worn off. So sure, maybe it's a little difficult at times to, to kind of hold your thumb on top of it while you're moving it. However, it still resets to the center, has good tension and most likely has never drifted or had any kind of like false inputs happen. I know a lot of the talk around the Dreamcast has to do with things like the uh, the VMU, which was a really cool idea for a memory card. And even things like going online, the keyboard, be able to check your email and have full uh, multiplayer support out of the box. That was cool stuff. But the analog stick actually used magnets and Hall effect sensors in order to accomplish its inputs, which is exactly what you see companies attempting to do now because it eliminates the need for a physical connection of say a potentiometer, which is the biggest problem we're running into currently. The, the entire situation around the Joy-Con does center around that issue, where as you're using the controller, it only has so many like uh, like movements for lifetime cycles to where after a little while you'll have like the inside of it kind of rub down and you'll see like debris or, or other things kind of form inside that adds to issues of false readings. But the Dreamcast and even a late Sega Saturn controller with the with the joystick on that didn't have those problems because that's actually the way that Sega was trending with their controllers and they must kick themselves because so many things that they had figured out back then would have really helped us now if they had stayed in the console manufacturing business. I mean, really, they had a lot of ideas that I feel like other companies around them would have latched onto if they were there to be competitive with them. Well, we had six Phillips head screws holding this on here and then we have the back coming off showing us our triggers, which I mean, yeah, we use triggers a lot now. And in fact, this shape was essentially what we saw in the, uh, the original Xbox controller at the time when it released. But for the most part, it's a pretty simple looking controller inside with the board. And we have a couple of screws up here that should be holding the plastic down along with some screws on this side for the board. Now with all those screws out, the board does lift off here. We have our D-pad plastics, the buttons, the start button down here. So it's pretty easy to get to them to clean them. And then if we flip this over, we have our rubber membranes for the buttons for the D-pad with the little, little piece of plastic here just to kind of help out with it more or less rotating around it. So you have that pivot point membrane here for the start button. And then we have our joystick. Here's the cool thing about this joystick. Uh, it just comes off. Yeah, it, it's not actually soldered down. So let's say there is a problem and this gets broken or damaged, or yes, the grip on top starts to kind of fade off of there as it's being used. You just kind of pop this off and remove it. You can put a new one on. And with a good look at the board, you can see four different sensors. They are HED one, two, three, and four. 
These, along with the magnet that we would have inside our joystick mechanism, is how it can track any of the movements you're doing when you're playing a game. Which means there's no physical contact between the joystick moving around and the part that would be tracking it, which is the big problem we're currently running into with uh, current joysticks with the potentiometer rubbing up against surfaces. So this was a really cool thing for Sega to do with the Dreamcast, and they did this as well with uh, a Sega Saturn controller, and that kind of just worked its way in this generation with the controller. Now we can go a bit further with this as the joystick will just pop off of there. And then we have a couple of really small tabs here that we can squeeze together and pop this plastic off of, which once opened, we can see the bottom of our joystick here along with a pretty sizable spring. This just continues to add tension to the stick as it's moving around. So you could technically replace this spring if it becomes loose, but for most Dreamcast uh, controllers that I've seen that weren't just like thrown down a flight of stairs or, or, or something, usually the spring is okay, and that's why most you'll find still have that nice tension to it. Anyway, this is the part that I'm sure most people are interested in because it is the magnet that would be tracked by these Hall Effect sensors. So as you could see, it was sitting here and it would be moving around and you can kind of see how it would sit on top and then the sensors would react to its movement, but there's never any contact between them. It'd just be magnets sort of interacting, giving an idea to the board, which would then relay it to the system in real time as to where you are with the joystick and where the character, whatever, should move on screen. And the reason this is so appealing is because it doesn't make any contact. And I'll admit, I'm a little curious why this wasn't really picked up. I know the Dreamcast, I, it had issues and it went away and then the PS2 and the Xbox and the GameCube basically rolled through the rest of the way with that generation. But it seems odd that no one else looked at that and went, wow, that's actually a good idea. We already took some of the other stuff in the Dreamcast. Let's go ahead and take the joystick too. It's also nice because this joystick is pretty easy to take apart and put back together. It's very modular. So a lot of times you'll see a joystick come apart and uh, it, it doesn't go back together quite right. Not at all with, with this one here. So in terms of like repairability, it's, it's actually pretty good. Like. There we go, it's back together in no time, just a couple of tabs and you drop the spring in. Now that's not to say that the Dreamcast was a perfect controller because it, it had its own issues. I know the triggers would kind of have problems and become loose at times or just completely broken. And I'll be honest, I, I never really got the whole controller cable comes out the bottom aspect to it because most of it's just wrapped around to the top anyway. I feel like that was mostly just to get out of the way of the VMU that was at the top, but still, it was very strange. However, it's hard not to notice that, yeah, it's still very relevant today with all of the talk around things like Joy-Con drift and controllers having issues with their analog sticks. So, hey, shout out to Sega. They figured it out, and unfortunately, they just ran out of money. However, I do wonder what the the future would have looked like if they had launched the Dreamcast with DVD playback support and it was able to hold its own and sell tens of millions of consoles and Sega was still around now because they were at a very high level of innovation in the late 90s with this system. So where would they be now and what would they have influenced some of their competitors like a Microsoft, a Nintendo or a Sony? to do. Would we all have Hall Effect sensors in our controllers? I, maybe, but then we'd also probably have like flying cars and we'd have that picture, the meme online where what the future would have looked like if this happened. That might have been it if the Sega Dreamcast had continued on. But let me know what you guys think about this down below. Are you surprised that Sega had Hall Effect sensors that we're hearing a lot about now to solve Joy-Con drift like 20 years ago? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.